Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Untangling Climate Finance. I'm Jay Tipton. In this episode, I'll be talking with the razor sharp and ultra lively Sean Kidney. Sean is the CEO of Climate Bonds Initiative, which is an international NGO working to mobilize global capital for climate action. Via his organization, he works with an impressive list of clients, ranging from banking giants like HSBC, Citi, and Barclays, to the S&P Global, the New York Stock Exchange, Moody's, and many, many more. Sean has decades of experience in the bond space, so he was the perfect guest to connect with regarding green bonds, the use of their proceeds, the prevalent topic of greenwashing, and how we can get more climate finance moving to slow down the climate crisis. Now, I could go on and on about Sean's fantastic credentials and work, but I'd rather you hear from the source. So let's dive in. Hi, Sean. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Of course. So before we get into it, why don't you just tell me uh, a little bit about yourself, your name, where you work, your job title, where you're from, all of that good detail. Well, where I'm from gets complicated, but let me start off with job. So... I run the uh, founder and I run the Climate Bonds Initiative, which is a global NGO working to mobilize capital for climate solutions. Uh, We work in all major markets and we're about how do we fix this mess we have got ourselves into quickly, fast enough to avoid other catastrophe. That's what we do. Right on. And I know that you've been in the bond space for a very long time, but you mind painting a little bit of a picture of your career pathway to when you probably finished school to where you are now running the CBI? So I am not a financial guy. Well, I wasn't before taking on this role. The climate bonds issue, something I set up in 2009, launched it at the Copenhagen COP when I'd published with a colleague, a friend, a uh, a paper on what to do around climate change and capital markets, outlining the strategy. I was on the board of Greenpeace Australia at the time, and I went to the COP, and I'm thinking, you know, I could be wrong here. There were 500 folks from Greenpeace, 500 folks from WWF there who, who I knew, knew a few of them, and I kept thinking, you know, maybe they'll pull it off. But really, it became clear in the second week the strategy was entirely wrong. They were focusing on Obama. No point in focusing on Obama. We have to focus on China or Congress or whatever. And I just realized... We need to do, have an entirely different approach here. So I said, damn it, I've done the strategy. No one else is picking it up. We'll launch the organization. And that's how we started on this road, which is about bonds, but it's actually about capital of all kinds. Bonds being the keystone of the market. You know, the bond market is 30% to 50% larger than the equities market. And for our prime stakeholder base, that is the people we are targeting, asset owners, around the world who kind of own everything. They're 60 to 90% in bonds. So if you can't get the story about bonds right, nothing else works. Mm-hmm. But my background is not in finance. My background is in social, I'm, I'm what they call a serial social entrepreneur. And I've spent years sitting up and running all my life, sitting up running organizations around causes and communications and marketing and social change. And I had a bit of a midlife crisis as I was approaching my 50s. And that crisis eventually, eventually, crisis take a while to unfold, led me to the seat, oh God, I've just got to work on climate because there is no future if we don't fix this. There's no future for my kids. And I just arrived at the point where I realized that's it, that's the rest of my life. And that led me to the process of, okay, so what's the strategy? How do we make this happen? What are the opportunities to shift the world here quickly? and led to that paper I mentioned and eventually launched the organization. And, you know, I'm going to say it's unfolding pretty well as expected, although it's always a surprise when an audacious strategy works. You think the strategy, you think, yeah, that's right, we've gotten to this. What did actually happen? You think, Jesus, it really is happening in front of me. And, you know, we now have the world's largest investors and banks as our partners. You know, they sniffed a cent of money. That's all right. Part of the strategy we're trying to pursue is to turn addressing climate change into an investment opportunity, not a cost. And that's why there are partners. That part's working. We support governments in Europe, in China, in places like Singapore and Brazil, all around the world with what they can do to mobilize capital. We support corporates around the world. And like, it's just extraordinary, yeah. I'm going to say. 
the energy we're getting. The only trouble is the whole world is running a little bit late and uh, well, a lot late. And so as much as one can pat oneself on the back for having made a few steps in the right direction, you kind of realize that climate has overtaken us all and we need to be sprinting and we're not there yet. So that's the sobering part of it. Yeah. And you touched on your, your partner list. If anybody were to navigate to your organization's website, you realize that your partner list is simply off the wall. And so just to name a few of these, because you had mentioned some, you're working with Citibank, JP Morgan, UBS, Barclays, and then on the market side, the S&B Global, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. And so my question is, what is your aim here? Are you going for total dominance of, of all the largest financiers and marketers in the world? Well, and our aim is twofold. It's one is to get everyone who has a shred of interest in vacant money. And that includes long-term investors whose job it is to ensure your pension fund paid in 40 years' time, to realize that if we make this shift, yeah, it's a big capital lump. Yes, there's a lot of work to be done. But yes, it can be designed to be a financial opportunity and we, make, we can make money for all, wealth for all out of us. So for that reason, we want everyone who's involved in that game to be running in the same direction. Think of it as a, as a herd of elephants in the plains. We don't want them running in all directions. We want them running together in the green direction. And if we do that, we can change the planet. And so absolutely want to engage that. Let's face it. Those organizations at the moment are pulling all over the place. Pretty well every organization we talked about has a bad side and a good side. They're doing some good things, but at the same time, they're doing stuff which is killing us. Yep. That's no different to all of us, right? Like, I mean, my daughters regularly tell me what I do wrong. I won't go into the details. That's okay, Jay. But, you know, I'm conscious that we are all a mixed bag. We, we do good things. Part of this is to say to give out bouquets for the parts of us that are doing good work and to kick us in the shins for the part of us that are not doing the right thing. And that applies as much to JP Morgan and the city as it does to you and me in our daily life. And I want to be careful here because I'm not going to suggest that all those organizations have got halos. They haven't, but they are changing. And we've got to try and amplify that change as quickly as possible. Yeah. And I do want to come back to this uh, bit of dichotomy a little bit later, but before we go further, can you just provide an overview of what CBI is actually doing? It's a mission and the work that it's actually promoting within finance. So we, we do a bunch of things. And the first thing is we encourage issuance of bonds and other capital markets, just like loans and so on around the world, where a proper accounting of how the process is being used is made and how we support climate change. So we're trying to get money to go to climate change. So we're saying, tell us what you're doing, explain to the investors out of the world how you're addressing the challenges we face. And we're trying to make that a norm, not a rare a niche part. And it's becoming a norm. We have the thematic bond market now is about $4 trillion outstanding. It was a couple of billion when we started. So that's, that's happening already. In other words, investors are saying, Look, we're keen on investing in you, but we want to know how you're using the money and is it addressing these other risks that we're worried about around climate change and which is everything in the economy while you're at it. So tell us what you're doing. So that's beginning to beginning to happen. We encourage that around the world. We provide tools to help with that. For example, we develop what are called what we call green definitions or taxonomies. We're certification scheme so that if you buy a bond, you could quickly look on your Bloomberg or Affinity Terminal, oh yeah, it's a green one, bingo. And if you've got a client over there who says, buy me a bond, but if you can make a green, that's really good, I can match them. That's why it grows. And because we provide those tools to make it easy for investors to act, they do act. And they are acting at volume and scale. So that, that's a key thing we do. We also support governments making these regulatory tools. So there's been taxonomies now model of the Klumpos taxonomy, brought into regulation in China, in Europe, and in a bunch of other countries, which is essentially guidance for what 1.5 degree investors look like. Mm -hmm. What's consistent with the world we've got to address given climate science. These are science-based taxonomies. It's the second thing we do. A third thing we do is we track data about all of this stuff, and we feed it 
to index providers, to investors, to banks. So they want to know what's happening, who's doing what and so on, we're the primary source. We're the primary source not because we've got the best data collection. People like Bloomberg and Infinity have that too. It's because we add the independent NGO approach to what counts as 1.5 from consistent. In other words, a solid science-based and credible approach. Yeah. So that curation, that's another service we offer, which is a service with a purpose, right? Because what we try to do is to get everyone to sing from the same hymn sheet. We want people to understand that what qualifies as climate is not something you decide on your opinion in whether you're in France or in Canada, but rather science-based and science is global. So we're driving that process. And then we do a bunch of other stuff. We published a guide for ministries of finance around the world called 101 Policy Ideas for Mobilizing Capital. And now we continue, that's an ongoing project uh, on that one. So these are the sort of things, you know, all the apparatus of building an ecosystem of investments in credible climate solutions and all the policies to drive it. Yeah, I was just going to say what you've done is essentially create the ecosystem with all of the vital inflows and outflows of information. And in fact, if someone were to navigate to your guys' homepage, which I suggest everyone does, I love the the green bond tracker that you guys have on the homepage that's just literally tracking uh, what month and in what year and the amounts of green bonds that have been issued. It's such a simple thing, but it's visually uh, and, and from a data perspective, incredibly helpful. But I do want to go into the green bonds section of this uh, conversation, and I want to start a little bit generally, because as you said, you focus on on mobilizing the bond market to finance climate solutions. A big part of this is green bonds. And so I'm wondering, can you discuss the significance and the importance of green bonds and the role that they play in our overall transition to a low carbon economy? Well, remember that in a sense, we don't care whether you label something green or not. All we really care about is that money is being invested in the things that are consistent with the future we've got to build. But the labeling tool makes it easy for everyone. If there's a credible system of what defines greed behind, that's what I talked about a minute ago, then from an investor's perspective, all right, if it ticks that box and it's linked to a credible system, cool, I'm cool, I'll invest. So the easier you can make that bridge between the people who are looking for solutions and the people who are offering solutions, of course, the faster and easier, the more quickly the market will grow. And that's the benefit of the labeling scheme. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit like fair trade coffee and so on. It just makes it easy for people to tie into solutions that they want to support. So whilst it, technically we don't care, we want you to build a solar power farm somewhere in the world. If we can bring it into this labeling universe, things happen faster as we're proving. That, that's what the Greek bond things. But you know, at the end of the day, what it is is capital going to something that's consistent with the future we've got to build. That can be a green bond, a green loan, green equity. There are green retail products. There are green credit cards. Now, we will look at these green credit cards and we will say, huh, how are they using the proceeds? Or is this consistent? What are their rule sets here? And if they're consistent, we're happy to say, bigger, that's a kosher one. But if they're making sure if the money is going or if they're tracking stuff which is not consistent, classic example, banks or companies that claim that gas is green, well, science doesn't agree with you now, I'm afraid. That doesn't count. So we're going to exclude you from the global listings and the global universe. And that's how we make the label a really useful tool for investors. And of course, that's a big part of your standards and certifications work as well, because the the label is only as good as the integrity that's behind it, and otherwise it loses this integrity. So it's absolutely important piece of that. And of course, as you said, it it makes the the simplicity of the the finance a little bit better, and in that, of course, speeds things up. So all in all, very good. But looking at the you know the green bond sales for the year, so I was just reading a, a Bloomberg article, and it said that in the first half of this year, and I'm sure you already know all of this, but. Uh, almost $350 billion was raised from green bond sales and loan arrangements, while in oil, gas, and coal-related financing was less than $235 billion, which is obviously more than I would prefer, but we're making progress. But anyways, if we look back to about a year ago, the ratio was $300 billion green versus $315 billion fossil fuels. So this is the first time in history that green bond issuances has passed those for fossil fuels. So my initial reaction is that this is great news because one, It shows there's a willing and demanding market. And then two, it's demonstrating that there actually is applicability of climate finance. 
I think that from some of the opinions that I've read, others are a little bit more skeptical simply because they're taking that kind of cautious, let's wait and see approach, which isn't understandable in this given moment. But I am curious, you know, what is your take on this landscape shift that we're seeing now in 2023? Look, we've had a, quite a few wins in the last three years. And it's important to savor the wins because you've got to feel like you're making progress, right? Yeah. And there are some macro wins and some micro wins. I mean, the, you know, the macro win, one of the big wins was the, was the Biden Climate Summit. We had a couple of bodies like the European Commission commit to strong 2030, most importantly, and then all of a sudden the strong productivity targets prior to that. But then Biden managed to get a whole bunch of companies to bought of the rich, rich world to get that was incredible. And probably investors, the groups we worry about most, was especially important because they did arrive in a view, oh, Jesus, this is really going to happen. Like, you know, we don't know who's going to mess it up. But right. given all of these countries are committing, basically the future has been decided. It will be green. We don't know how quickly Iraq is going to deliver on it. But the momentum is now once told. So that was incredible. It, 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 there's a tsunami coming through the global economy. Everyone agrees. Now, we just have to figure out how to wide the way up in Drenham. Now, I pick winners and lose. The other things we've had have been a week of renewable energy, which, by the way, is state, thanks to strong state action in Germany in 2001, thanks to Green Party, I think what they did, and in China, after that, for commissioning the largest pipelines, solar and wind energy in history, which is due to the costs of now, sold because of it, solar in places like Arkansas is acting just cheaper than gas. And so the Republican counties are building solar plants rather than gas plants. That's the dividend of that strong action. That's a win. We've had some wins in terms of business. They built these wonderful homes in 2021 in the same months in uh, September when the stock market capitalization of Next Era, which is a big renewable energy coupling that used to be a coal car in the US overtook the stock market capitalization of Exxon. Exxon, they were the world's biggest company when I was a kid. Uh, and in London, the same months, the stock market capitalization of Austin, which used to be the Danish coal-fired power station company, is now the world's largest energy company, overtook the stock market capitalization of BP. And all company, whoa, that was a win. At the win you, you mentioned, in terms of Bobby Schwartz, that is a win, it's a marker. We also saw the net revenues from the global banks City Bank's Jade Borders, which you mentioned earlier, is by 2021, overtake the net revenues from the fossil business. So all of this is progress. You know, there is no doubt that we've now shifted onto a track of building green and sustainable faster yeah. than building fossil fuel investments. Putting aside the odd weird gyration, like spike in prices because of the Ukraine war, you know, this is going to be a smooth run. This is going to be volatile, right? The only trouble is, actually, we need to stop fossil fuels entirely to have a chance of keeping temperature to 1.5 and that which is a reasonable or passable future for our kids. And we've missed that boat. World Meteorological Organization has now said that we're going to see 1.5 degree temperatures by 2027, which is pretty damn scary, which means we're on a track now to 2, 2.5 degrees, and we're now fighting to see when we get enough sequestration activity study in the next 15 years to bring temperatures back down. This is a really tall order, but about the only strategy we have left. So there's lots of wins. We are making progress. It's important to savor and celebrate, but we have to be careful to keep our eye on the main game. And the main game is at the very minimum, you'd have to say, we are really risking everything. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. So we're uh, so that's uh, that's where I keep my my eye focused on. Well, yeah, and I mean that's important because we are certainly not on track. We're supposed to be reducing our overall greenhouse gas emissions, and they're increasing year on year. And so with the the window in which we cut them by fifty percent by twenty thirty is passing. It's hard to believe we're already in August of twenty twenty three. Uh, just a couple more months and we're in 2024 and then we're halfway through the most crucial decade. So it is important, obviously, to keep our eye on that goal because that's what science tells us we have to be doing. I wanted to ask, you know, because you obviously you just laid that out beautifully. And I, I am curious, are there any other trends that you're seeing kind of evolve inside of the green bond space or the bond space? Because obviously we just said that for the first time, 
you know, green bond issuance is, is past uh, dirty energy. Hopefully that continues. It sounds like there's a lot of wind in its sails, but have you noticed any other um, changes, I guess, in the field of climate finance since you first started on your journey? Oh, look, the big change in the last couple of years has been the pressure on companies to develop transition plans and to start preparing. I know there's a few reasons for that. I mean, there's been a movement amongst some investor advocates to get engaged with companies, get to boards of directors to start bringing in plans to shift to becoming low carbon. That's been really important. But the other big win is that Biden summit win, which is what investors started realizing that the world was going to be green. It was just a matter of time. They started thinking, Jesus Christ, we've got to make sure that all our shareholding, all our companies get their act together. And so there's certainly the bigger investors started asking a lot more questions. How are you getting ready for the changes coming through the system? How are you going to make money and make sure we get returns? And that's driven a movement for transition plans in the context of a rapidly greening world economy, helped by the fact that a few countries have started bringing in regulatory requirements for transition plans. Europe, the UK, and even the Philippines now make it mandatory for listed companies to bring forward transition plans in the context of achieving our 1.5 degree targets. This is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. This is a really important development. And we're working with all these bodies as part of this process. So there's there's things like this beginning to happen. I mean, there's more in technology. The dividends of the solar revolution, the solar and wind revolution keep playing out. One of the reasons we've got hydrogen being talked about around the world, the only reason really, is because solar and wind have become so cheap, we can now envisage producing green hydrogen at a competitive rate. And that changes the economics of energy generation in lots of industries, cement, steel, aviation even. So these things are continued, but that's pretty exciting. That's an amazing change. Yeah. You know, I get every country I go to, people say, oh, yeah, I know this green stuff, but it's more expensive. And, you know, we've got coal, we've got gas, you should let us use it. I'm saying, you're thinking 20th century. Yeah. You've got it wrong. Yep. If you think they're cheaper than solar, you, you haven't understood what the current economics are. Have another look. It's actually cheaper for you now to build new energy in India. I'm being told by Indian thermal power companies, they make two and a half times per kilowatt hour by building solar than off their thermal coal power plants. They're abandoning thermal power because it's just not as profitable. Yeah. That is a win. Yeah, that's a win. All of the electric vehicles. And this isn't just a Tesla story. This has been driven by China, energy security reasons, as much as for air pollution and climate change reasons. They've been pushing the growth of electric vehicles. So There's only 20% of all cars sold were electric last year. And you know, I was in Shanghai recently, and I went to a carbon neutrality fair the Shanghai National Exhibition Center, the biggest exhibition center in the world, as far as I can see. And I went into one hall, the auto hall. There were 20 car companies showing off models. You can get in it, you could get in and turn the engine on, which are all electric. 15 of those were Chinese-only companies. And I'm thinking, this is incredible. I kind of lost track of how quickly it's changing. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of excitement out there. Yeah, absolutely. And it is moving quick, which is good. Uh, we just need a little bit quicker. However, um, I do want to go back to uh, some of the challenges, and you kind of addressed these a little bit. I do want to dig into them a little bit more. And so when we're thinking about scaling up green climate finance, some of the challenges that we need to address are the greenwashing, the integrity. If we use a, a concrete example, we can go back to J.P. Morgan Chase and Citi, which at the same time as they were the, the biggest underwriters of green bonds and loans, they are also the two biggest lenders to oil and gas. And so this creates this, as you said earlier, two sides of the story. And so I'm curious, you kind of addressed this a little bit earlier saying that nobody's perfect, that's for sure. But when we're talking in the hundreds of billions of dollars and it's happening hand in hand, I'm curious, what is your take on this and how do we address this specific issue? The way we address this is to set up a review and reporting and transparency around the use of proceeds. So if you decide to borrow money from your aunt to buy a car, and your aunt says, that's all very well, but I want you to buy an electric car because it's better for the planet. And you say, absolutely. And then you say, and I'm going to come every Christmas and take you for a drive to show you how cool it is in the electric car. That's reporting and transparency. Now, you might be using petrol-based buses or other kinds of activities to decide in other parts of your life. But for the use of that load, you're going to only use it for an electric car. That's a green bond. 
Now, that means JP Morgan can borrow money to invest in solar or whatever it might be whilst it's doing bad stuff. That's how this works. Equally, if they're underwriters, when they're underwriting a green bond, we need to make sure the reporting and transparency aspects of the market of the bond are in place. And that is, we can know the money be used. But that doesn't stop them doing stuff for oil companies or coal companies on the side. I know that. And that's a separate issue. We've got then a separate challenge of saying to JP Morgan, you know what? You're just messing around. You could make a hell of a lot more money if you did more green stuff. Yeah. Look at the opportunity and cut out your brown stuff. And by the way, you're messing up your reputation because you've got a reputation for funding brown. And that means the customers who've got green or looking for green are going over to Bank of America. So they've got a rep- better reputation because they internally stopped funding all coal some seven years ago. So, and you set up a kind of race to the top along these lines. So that's how you achieve a change. But I'm going to say that getting a big institution to fully exit fossil fuels now is a tough call. That's what I'd like to get to. But what we're doing in the green bond market is that we're starting the story by saying, well, at least we will know how the green stuff is being visited. We're going to encourage you to do more green stuff because it's really profitable, because the money gets placed, because investors really want it. And in that, we will then get to the stage where at some point you're going to say, damn it, I don't need to do this fossil fuel stuff. And frankly, it's recruiting my green business that's way bigger, a bit like that factoid about green bond issuance overtake fossil fuel issuance. There comes a point when dealing with the kinds of clients that are on the nose becomes a negative for you. And you've got to start moving on to the areas we're going to make more money and more. Just, that's really what we're getting to in all this. Now, if we can hasten that of regulation, hey, I'm all for it. If we can get central banks to say, you know what, you should scale down your fossil fuel activities, we're all for it. And we are working that side of the equation as well, by the way. But from a voluntary perspective, I'm not going to get, I don't think I can win the argument get you to Jamie Diamond to walk away from all fossil fuel investments this year. It's going to take a little bit longer. Certainly not when they're recording the the profits that they did in 2022, that's for sure. Exactly. <laughs> and so um, you said the reporting is a big part of it. And you've also said that some governments are doing you know uh, better in this and moving a little bit faster. Are there any that stick out at the top of your mind that are, are kind of leading the way in terms of this regulation, this reporting? Uh, that you're working with? Because you, you did mention some earlier, but I know that you're very deep in this. Look, look, governments are a bit like banks or you and I. They've got good parts and bad parts. Some sides are doing really good work. Some sides, frankly, are messing up. So I've got to be careful what I say here because no one's perfect. However, there's some pretty cool stories floating around. The work that People's Bank of China has done to grow green finance, it doesn't mean the Chinese economy is shifting fast enough yet. But they are investing more in Ruba G every single year than any other economy in the whole world. So, you know, some things are working. That's a really nice story. The work that DG FISMA, that's the European Commissioner's Ministry of Finance, has been doing around promoting sustainable finance activities is a very, very cool story. It makes me immensely proud to be a European citizen. The work that the US government has done with the IRA flawed as it is thanks to Joe Manchin, because it's got boondoggles for gas in there too, <laughs> has nevertheless been incredibly influential in growing a whole bunch of industries. And, you know, I applaud them for that. Yeah. US Treasury has done a great job with Department of Energy bring that over the line. Yeah. So, you know, everywhere you got, if I want to look at the governments that are overall doing best, well, you've got a couple of small governments like Costa Rica that has a 100% renewable energy economy. Yeah. Or Denmark. Denmark, you now that story about Orsted, which used to be the coal energy company of Denmark, has now the world's largest wind energy company. Right. Well, the current government got in on a climate change platform, and they have set in plan this amazing root and branch review of everything. Every ministry has got a change strategy to achieve this goal of 2030 cuts of 70% in emissions. Unbelievable. The biggest challenge are pigs. The biggest source of emissions in Denmark nowadays are pig farms. So they're working on what the hell they do in that area. But in the meantime, they've got the world's largest wind energy program now. They're planning to build enough wind turbines off the coast of Denmark. In a deal they've done with the gas industry and the unions in the gas industry to shift them. They're going to create wind energy jobs to pick up 
jobs that are being lost in the gas industry. Yeah. They're going to be able to generate something like 75% of all Europe's electricity needs on a good day. This is like an unbelievable amount of wind energy generation. Yeah. They're going to use a lot of that to create green hydrogen in these big islands they're building off the shore of Denmark. And I'm going to say every government in the world has got to think aggressively like that. Every government. And so that's actually good, Sean, because I, I want us to kind of look towards the future. And so if we want to 100x the access and deployment of green bonds on a global scale, what absolutely needs to happen for us to do that? Green bonds are the kind of tracker, right? As they grow, it shows we're taking action. But clearly, there are some green bond things to be done. We need to make sure that there is clarity about what qualifies. We're working on that, but we need everyone to stick to the science and stop getting railroaded by special interests, which does happen every time you take something into a government. You literally say, hang on, hang on, hang on, wait a minute. That gas plant, that's green. That's much better than... No, it's not. If you listen to any scientists in the world, they will start telling you what qualifies and what doesn't. Time to listen to the scientists. We've been ignoring them for 30 years. That's one. Two, incentives. Tilt the playing field to green. It's been tilted to brown for most of modern history. We now need to tilt it the other way. So we put biases in everywhere. Less investment requirements, risk rating formulas from central banks so that banks can get a higher leverage ratio out of green investments instead of brown investments. Asset purchasing arrangements. All governments and central banks should have place a priority in buying green bonds over ordinary bonds or Britain, and they should exclude fossil fuel bonds from their portfolios. These are simple things that don't cost anything that can be doing. Regulation. Dutch Central Bank has banned loans by banks to highly energy efficient, inefficient buildings. Simple, very simple. And then, of course, there's incentives and energy policy. I mean, energy policy in some countries needs reform. In Indonesia, the government makes it prohibitive to build solar. The interconnection costs for a solar plant into the grid are huge. Why? Because they've got vested coal interests. All of these things need to start changing everywhere. But above all, this is a review of every sector of the economy. Land use, industry, transport, as well as energy, as well as property, urban development. It's a matter of looking for things that can be done to rapidly shift capital in a fiscally efficient manner. We're not made of money here. We've kind of blown our budgets and covered. So we have to do it in a fiscally efficient kind of way. But we can the opportunities are there. If we did this in a consistent fashion across the major economies of the planet, we still have a chance of getting out of the hellhole that we're going into. That was an incredible list. And because you're the you're the absolute expert on it, it holds such strong weight. So I appreciate that. You laid that out beautifully. And we got to make progress. And I remain optimistic. It sounds like you also carry around a level of optimism with you, which is good. And that's, I guess, the only way we can do it. So my final question for you, Sean, when we close out is I always like to ask, uh, the same question, and it comes from the School of Philosophy of Stoicism. The great Stoic philosopher Epictetus once said, what concerns me is not the way things are, but the way people think things are. And if we apply this to climate finance, what do you think is one thing that must be done to change the way people think about climate finance? There's one messaging objective I have that overrides all others. It's encompassed in the scale of what we have to do and the sense that the way we built our societies in the world in the past is not for leaving it to market forces. It's about actively mobilizing capital for solutions, whether that be to build the highways of America or whether that be to build bridges over the Hudson. It's about designing the incentives so capital will flow in the right direction. We've got to invest something like $90 trillion dollars in solutions that are consistent the future we've got to build in the next 20 years. This is an extraordinary thing. We have never invested that much capital in such a short time in the history of humanity. The good news is we have the capital. We have huge savings pools around the world. We've done very well at constructing savings pools. We have the money. Our asset owners want, they want to invest in green because they believe that tsunami of change is coming through. We simply need to construct the solutions for them. We are so unbelievably lucky. We have the money. We have the solutions. We've got to start putting it together in a way 
that will, will open the forces, if you like. And this will be the biggest investment boom in the history of humanity. This will be, if we do it right, if we design it right, one that will spread wealth around emerging markets because 70% of this investment's got to happen in emerging markets. It will create new wealth and new opportunities. From an investor perspective, this is like looking at the gold rush just as it's beginning to get started. That's the message I'd like to get across to everyone. Love it. That was a home run. Absolute home run, Sean. So thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, joining me today and your thoughts. And uh, this was a fantastic conversation. So really, I, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for the time, Jay. Thank you so much for doing this podcast. And that wraps up another episode of Untangling Climate Finance. I'll be back in December with a fantastic guest, David Antonelli. Many of you might recognize David's name from his long tenure running Vera, the world's largest certifier of voluntary carbon credits. I take full advantage of David's deep knowledge and experience in the VCM to really dig into the current state of the market and what changes need to happen to shed its growing reputation of a truly troubled system. Make sure you tune in for the episode. You do not want to miss it. And as always, if you want to connect, you can shoot me an email at jtipton at gordiannotstrategies.com. A link to my email address is in the show notes. And if you're interested in joining me for an episode, or if you have someone else in mind, I'd be happy to talk. And finally, please be sure to subscribe and leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. We genuinely appreciate reading your thoughts and your support. Thanks for joining me and catch you next time. This podcast is produced by Gordian Knot Strategies.